This is the Anarchist War Journal entry number two, with the great positive feedback that uh, I received from the last one exposing the cowards that are the Richmond Communist Group. I'm going to continue pressing forward. I'm going to continue doing this kind of format. The journal entry that I'm going to cover is the uh, spreading anarchy that took place at the International Students for Liberty Conference in D.C. I went there with a couple of friends, with Herzon, Phil, and uh, Ty, <laughs> and we all caravan out there. Uh, we stayed there at the hotel, and we had a lot of great, enjoyable uh, moments there, just um, debating, uh, creating new friends, and most important, I guess, for me, kind of checking out what these groups are kind of offering. What, what is this conference really about? What are, what are they promoting? Uh, what do people there think about the free market or, or anarchy? And so I met a lot of interesting people there. I saw, well, <laughs> I grabbed a good interview that so I'm going to be sharing with you as uh, the week continues, right? Uh, I, I met up with uh, David Freeman was the first person I met. Well, that was late at night. Didn't really get a chance to, uh, to capture a video with him, an interview with him. But I did manage to capture a video interview with uh, Nick Jaspelli from Reason.com, with James Anderson from, uh, from Fee, with uh, Jan Hellfield and Julie Borowski, and Robert Murphy, and Jeffrey Tucker, which is uh, the one that I'm going to talk in just about a second. The, of course, there's also Dylan from C4SS, and uh, <laughs> you're definitely going to enjoy that one. So, uh, how did it go? Yeah, I had a lot of fun. Um, it comes off to me as a minarchist conference of sorts, of course, the uh, underlying um, theme of it all, the areas in which um, I found uh, kind of, I guess, weird, right? There on, on Friday when we arrived, we thought we were going to catch the Pussy Riots performing, right? Because right there, you know, it's outlined on the schedule, Pussy Riot, right? It doesn't say we're going to have an interview with one member of the Pussy Riot band, Right? It seems kind of implied, you know, this is a rock band, that they're going to come out here on stage to perform. And we're going to have an awesome rock and roll experience imported from Russia. Right? But no, um, when we got there, um, you know, trying, trying to make it through rush hour and get through all the DC traffic. is like NASCAR racing through there. And uh, we thought we made it on time. But no, just uh, a band member, just this, you know, being interviewed on stage. And wearing a Bernie Sanders for president shirt, no less. What was up with that? It seems like someone failed, I guess, in the marketing department there or in the areas in which you want to draw guests and visitors. It's, uh, so I feel bamboozled. <laughs> I feel bamboozled. I feel tricked, right? Um, you know, if it's not going to be pussy right, it's just right... The name of the, of the person you're going to be interviewing, a member from Pussy Riot, right? And it's, don't, don't mislead all the people. And the same thing with, uh, I find a lot of the Libertarian Party out there kind of doing anyways. But, but yeah, that was, uh, that was a letdown. Um, but from there, from the rest of the, rest of the weekend, uh, we spent a lot of good time just um, philosophizing, debating, arguing. And uh, I'll be showing, sharing these, those quotes with you soon. So the first one I'm going to go over right now is the one I had with um, a great champion of liberty himself, Jeffrey Tucker. Um, yeah, I'm from Liberty RBA. Uh, yeah, sometimes of course. I do like a show on uh, Liberty on Me there. Yes, oh, of yeah. course. I know. I know you well. You're like this awesome street anarchist. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, you're um, thank you. Thank you. You're amazing yourself too. I was just showing him uh, the Rose Out as a Med Red video that he's never seen before. Oh right? yeah. I knew I was like a mere child. Yeah. <laughs> I know. Mozart is Red is a play that Rothbard wrote a long time ago, kind of describing the culty vibes he felt in the Ayn Rand uh, inner circle, and was then put together as a real play uh, <laughs> for his 60th birthday. And up there on stage is uh, Jeffrey Tucker. <laughs> I think Wendy Macri might be there as well. i got to double check that, but if someone can verify for me, that would be awesome. But you can find it today on YouTube. I'll probably put in the description link for you guys to watch too. It's it's a lot of fun to watch. <laughs> and still out here with your theatrical <laughs> performance. <laughs> well, you know, Naomi always inspires it. You know, she's like a performance artist herself. So she, and we're doing a thing at Freedom Fest. Uh, oh, are you? Okay. We're doing a Cole Porter duet. Oh, nice. Yeah. Nice, right? right? <laughs> That's what you want. Yeah. So. And you're seeing all the songs from the popular yeah. game off Fallout. You ever hear that? Fallout no. 4? No. Uh, they have all the oldies, like the 40s music in oh, there, yeah. too. So very popular. So, yeah. yeah. Great time of place and era of music. I would say big band era. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. yeah. Cole Porter was awesome. I mean, his stuff is so libertarian. So right. Yeah. Uh, so I guess we just want to start like I have five simple questions. Just okay. want to know uh, what your All thoughts right. are. Uh, I guess the first one would be, uh, how do you define a free market? Oh wow. Uh, well, I would say the matrix matrix of, of voluntary interactions, uh, insofar as it involves the material world and a certain population. So uh, that's it. Right. Yeah. It's uh, not a system. I mean, it's yeah. not a. No, no, no. Yeah. And it's it's un, unimpeded. So, so it's really it's a it's a peer to peer system. So you don't have to go through regulators or, or whatever. It's just what emerges is, emerges in the absence of a violent system of, of imposition. Right. That's that's all it is. It's not something you really sort of establish, or codify, you know, or or come, you know, make exist as a result of a constitution or anything like that. It's just it's just what we do when we're left alone. Yeah. Yeah. The natural order yeah, of things. Yeah. Yeah. The the original state of nature. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Maybe not the original, but it's one that emerges in a higher state of civilization. I guess in terms of like uh, yeah. co-opting the term and uh, taking away from like Hobbes' kind of description of nature. Oh, absolutely. Of it, right? Yeah. yeah. So last year, the theme for Anarchon that had uh, Benjamin so <laughs> gracefully uh, helped us decide and put together and help us uh, decide the meaning for that was uh, Anarchon, State of Nature. And State of Nature, of course, um, showing the opposite to be true in which Hobbes wrote, you know, there is a Leviathan because that exists nation states to keep uh, people in check because uh, the world as he saw it was uh, brutish, short, um, very cruel, right? It's just rife with violence. So to keep these people in check, you gotta create a larger organization of violence to kind of keep the peace, so to speak. But as uh, decades and centuries pass, you'll find that actually the opposite is true, right? You find that it's government itself to be that brutish, disgusting, cruel, um, Leviathan thing that exists today that is uh, pulled the wool over our eyes and seeing that actually the state of nature as, uh, it exists when there are real contracts. It exists when people advocate for a plurality of nonviolent solutions. State of nature actually is pretty much all around us, right? Wherever there is consent, you have anarchy. You have the real, true state of nature, which should be rediscovered and re you know rechanged and uh, viewed differently, right? The government, of course, always wants us to see that we're all secret Esther Morgans, that all of us could be uh, possible, you know, violent sociopaths. So, you know. Don't kind of draw together and create this kind of hub of a community. Just turn to the government for those solutions. Turn to the boogeyman because you can't trust any one of us. But of course, if you take the time to have a conversation with with your neighbors, with your community, you'll find that we share a lot of moral values, right? Against the initiation of force, and that's what the spreading anarchy series are all about, right? I have nearly three hundred recorded interviews showing that a majority of people, or like over 95 percent of them, agree that it's wrong and immoral to initiate force. Right? That it's wrong and immoral to violently force their ideas onto each other. That uh, that the air is outside of self-defense, right? Self-defense is not the initiation of force. It's defending yourself from the initiation of force. That we all agree with these precepts. And so I think that's something we kind of have to discover within our lives, within our community, uh, with the world around us, that the state of nature is actually peaceful. The state of nature is anarchy. Um, it's government itself that creates disorder. It's government itself that is chaos. Yeah. Uh, what would you uh, consider? Would you consider today that we have a free market? Oh uh, no, absolutely right. not. I mean, <laughs> in certain areas, in certain select ways, you know, like if I go down to McDonald's and buy a biscuit, you know, that's a beautiful exchange uh, between us. But on the other hand, the corporate world is 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 seriously encumbered by uh, you know, vast ranges of taxes and mandates and regulations that have cartelized the system. And, and really a permitted a kind of a corporate elite right. to dominate. Whereas I don't think that happens in a free market. A free market, everybody has a chance to enter the market. And, and it's a very disruptive system, which is one of the reasons people don't like it. Right. Too, much, too much change, you know, and the ruling class would rather just sort of keep things as they are. Right. Without government, there is no corporate elite, right? Yeah, that's yeah. right. That's the same right. immunity they grant themselves is the same thing as uh, state prosecutors saw for themselves. Difficult to sue and hold them liable for their actions, right? Yeah, right, right. Um, all right, my third question would be, uh, how would you define then what is anarchy? So a anarchy, I think, is what we experience every day insofar as we're choosing what we do. It's pretty simple. Um, and, uh, and anarchy is really the reason why life is wonderful. It's, it's anarchy is why you have the lovers you have and why your parents met. And, and, and 
and um, it's the, it's your choice to get up in the morning, what time you go to bed, what you want to eat. I mean, all these are decisions that take place within anarchy, which is to say they're not forced upon you. That's all anarchy is. It's, it's voluntary interactions. And you know what's funny about the term? Marx used to decry the anarchy of the market. He said we have to get rid of it, you know, right. the anarchy. And there's a sense in which he's right that all market activity is inherently anarchistic. In the sense, it's not being imposed by by violence. Right. That's all. It's just the absence of violence in human relationships. So the uh, essence of anarchy is consent. Oh, that's a beautiful way to put it. Right. Yeah. <laughs> to, to agree to do something and use your human volition to carry it out. That's that's anarchy. Right. So to the extent you do that, and everybody does, all days, we are all striving to live in anarchism. Right. Yeah. And, it's, and in that context, would you therefore say then it is against political rulers? Right. Uh, yeah, well, certainly. I mean, why do we have political rulers? I mean, uh, mostly they, they exist in a par parasitical relationship with us, and and they want us to vote for them and elect for them uh, and elect them, which is a mistake. Really, <laughs> we shouldn't be doing this because all we're doing is voting for we're electing people to who take away our human rights. And, right. And I, you know, it always breaks my heart. A little bit inside of me dies every time I hear somebody cheer a politician. <laughs> <laughs> No, no, I, I agree, I agree, I agree. I, I know you, uh, coming, I guess, from the Libertarian Party that was forming like in 1971, yeah. there was a lot of, uh, I guess, thrilling, uh, I guess, ambition to see if something like that could occur. No, you know? and I, I, I applaud the Libertarian Party and their efforts. I mean, what they're trying to do is reverse the, the pattern. Uh, political parties have always sought to fasten more control, so they're like, right. let's have a political party that seeks less control. Um, and I think it's an awesome idea. It's a little bit like uh, playing with fire. I think so too, yeah. right? Uh, and they've never been that successful. Thank you, right. I mean, so I would say, you know, there's no measure of success, I guess, in that effect, right? The size of the state is not shrunk or minimalized. How many laws did Ron Paul repeal? Um, and I guess in that sort well, of Ron sense. Well, Ron was interesting because he used to, when he was in office, he. He would deliver the introduced lots of legislation he knew had no chance of even going to committee, much less coming out of her or being subjected to a vote. So in that sense, he was incredibly unsuccessful, the least successful politician since World War II. And yet, um, all of his work inspired many people to get to work in their own lives uh, for human liberty. And you see the evidence of that at this conference. Right, of course. I say, of course, in that, yeah, I, I do see that Ron Paul has affected the lives of uh, Quite some number of people uh, at this conference though there's a, a question I was asking David Freeman when he showed up the night before um, and talking about his solution right that he gives in the machinery of freedom kind of tends to seem that the only solution or the prescribed solution is through politics right he wrote the book quite some time ago and the Libertarian Party came out in 1971 so they've had a good chunk of time to show a measure of success in terms of achieving freedom their politics, right? They're voting through their government, um, and I've seen nothing. I've seen nothing that has affected uh, me or brought me closer to freedom. But of course, uh, and his response was kind of the same in terms. Well, you know, you have Ron Paul that has um, created this effect, and it's like, no, well, you, you can't really quantify that, right? How how would you quantify in terms of how, if someone did come to freedom or understand freedom through Ron Paul? Is it uh, by still thinking that you still need slave masters? Uh, I mean, understanding the particulars of the Federal Reserve and how interest rates and money, all that stuff occurs, yeah, that's interesting. But uh, I would say that the real effect would be if the person still advocates then for a slave master, still advocates for a political ruler, and not to continue to seek their own enslavement and that of others, right? And so to that effect, I'll say no. Uh, I'll say that he's just only continued the fraud, perpetuated the fraud that politics, voting, and government will set you free. And I know it's an unpopular opinion out there with the libertarians out there, especially those who grew up with a lot of these uh, kind of connections and networkings and in that kind of environment and political campaigns. And they hold on to that out of Stockholm sentiments. And But it's something that you kind of have to examine and look at, right? The, if we were, <laughs> if, if politics... Could work right if there were there were political solutions there were ways to achieve freedom through all of that we would have, we would not have been born tax slaves right all the centuries of attempts to try to achieve freedom through politics um, by by its own standard then have failed failed right if there is a way uh, for us to achieve it through politics and voting and having a slave master bring it about or having government to to bring us freedom we would not have been born as tax slaves we would not have this conversation. 
Um, Lysander Spooner tried himself and was trying to con convince, convince and sway and pamphleteer his information to, to the ruling class, right? What do they care? They're violent sociopaths. Um, they will, their only interest is just to control you or run your life uh, as, as a farmer would livestock. So in that effect, uh, I haven't seen it. Um, here in Richmond, I probably know a small little handful of people in terms of uh, over the 100 anarchists that we have here. No effect. I mean, the Libertarian Party doesn't tell you that you do not need slave masters, right? Uh, but I guess in that general interest, uh, yeah, and some people eventually make the crossover to anarchy. Uh, it takes a while. Um, and therefore, I see it as uh, kind of ineffective, right? So I find it as uh, the pothole to the road of freedom, right? I want to get people there to the finish line, <laughs> right? I don't want to trick them otherwise. I don't want to um, tell that I want to be your slave master, right? I've never told that to my brother. But now I'm kind of going on a rant here, and I think uh, let's go back <laughs> to the video. Uh, I guess my last question in, in this particular area. The first thing, I guess, uh, do you vote? Uh, I haven't. I could just say, as a, as a practical matter, I've voted only one time in my life. Beautiful. Yeah, uh, and it was the first time I was eligible, and I felt like an idiot afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> and I never bothered to do it again. Wipe my hand clean, yeah, make my amends, right? I was like, oh, well, that was dumb. Yeah, all right. All on right. to the next thing, yeah. Um, I guess in that issue, I guess uh, so there's like uh, sometimes there's like talk, I guess, like Rand Paul, for example. Yeah. Um, I guess, uh, can you clarify, I guess, in, I guess in areas, like, to make it clear, it's like, do you, did you, are you advocating that he would, what would have made a good president, or do you just... Oh, I don't really uh, know. I don't okay. know if he would have or not, but I think his attempt, uh, sorry, he's a friend of mine, but right. uh, I think his attempt to do the best that he knew how with the power he had and the opportunities that were presented to him, I think it was, I think it was earnest, and I want to give him the benefit of the doubt that, that he believed he was doing the right thing. So, uh, and, and that's as far as I would go. I mean, right. I, 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 he never asked my opinion, right. but I, I never believed it was going to amount to much. But you know, the, the, here's what's interesting. Is it possible that the fact that he was running for the nomination, are we in four years going to look back, are many people going to look back and go, you know, in retrospect, that guy, that guy Rand was making a lot of sense about criminal justice reform, about military intervention, about civil liberties, about the drug war. Maybe. You know, he plants some seeds in people's minds. I don't know. All right. Yeah. Well, I guess that's something, I guess, people who are kind of like really into him. I mean, his father is Ron Paul, so, mm -hmm. you know, he has like a vested sentimentality mm -hmm. attached. And maybe in time, that's something for him to kind of figure out in, in his own trials and tribulations, right? Yeah. Um, but even still, though, you would never, you would not vote for Rand Paul or I, 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 have, I find it very doubtful that I would, uh, you know, like leave my desk to get up. To go. <laughs> that is a beautiful you know, anarchy. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard for me to imagine ever doing something like that. And if I did do it, it would only be for my own self edification, not out of a conviction that I made any difference whatsoever. Right. <laughs> so, but most likely, probably, I never would. That's I can't. Beautiful. I can't really imagine you know doing that. Yeah, can't imagine getting up and voting. Yeah. Oh, that that that, uh, yeah. that helps a lot. I say it helps a lot because there is a. Uh I guess an enter comment that he placed that the art of not being government picked up, right? In terms of, will cause an interesting uh, place of concern, of, uh, of interest to see whether someone's playing Switzerland or, or neutral, right? Um, you know, where, where are you in this position, right? You know, there's no uh, black, or there's no gray position, right? In terms of uh, grace, you can't have grace without blacks and whites, right? It's therefore to acknowledge that there are black and white positions out there. Um, so he made a quote that I'll read here for you real quick. It says, uh, I've always believed that the reform of American society is going to occur from within and not top down. But nonetheless, having a president like Rand Paul, who may be less willing to commit the troops abroad and enter into wars and unleash the FBI and the CIA against American citizens, has got to be a good thing. Um, so one, of course, uh, in terms of that context and uh, the way it was written, it seems sometimes that it could still imply that you still advocate for political rulers, uh, that there is perhaps some kind of dash or hope, and you know that's, that's the reason why I brought it up, right? I want to see exactly and to hear it from you, right? Um, and am I satisfied with uh, that? Yeah, it, it seems like he <laughs> he did. A, I, I love the answer. Good good response. He's been. I feel like he uh, has been honest in, in terms of uh, his experience and what is what he's seen, and I think it's. Uh, I'll, I'll take it for now, right? And I'm um, sure next time we meet up, um, it'll be even more concise and more <laughs> definite saying, yeah, politicians, <laughs> you know, toss them in the garbage, right? 
Um, but it's kind of difficult, like I would imagine, especially as you mentioned that you know that these are his friends. You know, he grew up within those those inner circles. Um, so yeah, it's maybe it's uh, sometimes I have the same thing with some of my friends, right? I'm, I have some status friends still out there, I guess. Um, new ones, right, that'll come across, and I give them their time to kind of figure things out, right? Um, I'm, I'm good at persuasion, but sometimes uh, with some people just kind of, you know, as, as they learn more and it takes a few weeks, a few months, and then they finally get it, but I, I give them the time to kind of, to come at that threshold, uh, to come to freedom, right? So, and uh, perhaps uh, someone who, someone like Rand Paul, who's been in that uh, position of, of politics all his life, uh, influencing, growing up in it, uh, yeah, that would take quite a long time for someone like him to turn around. So maybe that's what it is, and that's just uh, kind of you know lingering hope that he'll one day realize and let go of it as altogether. And uh, that's I guess what I get from this kind of response. But yeah, at least uh, I'll, I'll take it then as his position, unless he says otherwise, that he does not advocate for political rulers nor support them um, in any endeavor. Right? I think that comment was made about a year ago. So you know. Things change and people progress and uh, new thoughts form and uh, upgrade and evolve. So uh, let's continue. Uh, yeah, well, look, I, I think that I think that the burden of liberty really belongs in our in our lives. I right. mean, ultimately, we if we're going to have a lasting, sustainable uh, liberty that's that's effective in our lives, it's got to come from within and extend out of our choices that we make. Our salvation I, I, won't come from strangers on a platform on a I stage. Don't I don't believe it. I don't believe it. I'm just speaking as a, looking back at history and looking at present reality. A robust, lasting liberty has got to be built from below. Yeah, if you've seen, you've been involved for, for decades for quite a long time to see like if, if politics would ever have a chance you know, as a measure of success in, in that particular area of field. Um, it's great that you provide a good sober um, outlook on it, yeah. right? Well, um, I don't know about sober, but... <laughs> But an outlook <laughs> team, team never sober. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, let's have uh, some bourbon later this evening. Okay, yeah? love it. All right. All right. Thank you so Thank much, you so Jeffrey much. Tucker. I appreciate all your work. So I hope you guys enjoyed the interview you had with Jeffrey Tucker. That guy is a great champion of liberty. Uh, it's great to find someone out there who champions the cause of anarchy and especially capitalism, right? Um, that's rare to find. That's difficult to find out there. You know, there's a lot of people out there, especially in your public indoctrination camps and university levels. That's, you know, these fronts for cultural Marxism that will derive all the problems here that we have is capitalism, right? Uh, when you find, when you cut through all that bullshit and all the propaganda, actually the common denominator always points back to government itself. So for someone, for Jeffrey Tucker to go out there and talk about this unabashed, unafraid, and speak strongly uh, with commitment, with, uh, with the virtues that entail, that's, that's beautiful. That is a beautiful anarchy. And, you know, I, I applaud him. I applaud uh, the work that he's doing and the work that he will continue to do. And uh, if you guys want to check him out, you know, just Google his name. I'll put him a link uh, to some of his books in the description as well. And so with that, I'll continue uh, sharing some of the videos that uh, came out over the weekend. And let me know what you guys think. See you guys at Victory Party. Take good care. Left behind, dollar signs rule. But what about the fool who falls victim to the material world?